gar nichts von Ihnen. Sie sind so im Hellen. Können wir im Dunklen? Können wir das Licht ein bisschen runterfahren? Vielleicht. Das wäre schön. Ein bisschen. Denn wenn wir schon unsere wunderbare Autorin nicht hier haben in Person, möchte ich jedenfalls Sie sehen, richtig. Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Schön, dass Sie da sind, um Jamaica Kincaid leider nur per Stream heute Abend zu erleben. Sie konnte nicht kommen, sitzt, glaube ich, in Vermont, das werden wir Sie gleich fragen. Und ähm, werden dann mit ihr einfach nur über Bildschirm reden. Was richtig schade ist, weil natürlich irgendwie man nicht so richtig eine Verbindung zu jemandem aufbauen kann, den man nicht kennt, wenn man nur über Bildschirm miteinander redet. Mikrofon. Ich bin Gabriele von Arnim. Ich werde heute Abend versuchen, mit ähm, Jamaica Kincaid einige Themen anzusprechen und mir zu reden. Und neben mir sitzt Patricia Carlucci und die wird ähm, die deutschen Texte lesen. Und jetzt hätten wir natürlich sehr gerne Jamaica Kincaid. Do we have her? Not yet. Sie war schon da. Also die Wahrscheinlichkeit, dass, man, dass wir sie wieder kriegen, ist wohl relativ groß. Ah, there she is. Hello, Jamaica. Hello. Can you How hear us? You? Yes, I can. Very okay. well. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And we can hear you. So, um, as I said before here, just it's um, such a pity not to have you here in person, of course. We would have loved to have you here. I'm so sorry about that, too. Yeah, because when I heard you'd be coming and they asked me if I would be hosting you, I was thrilled, of course, because I thought this is finally an opportunity to meet her. So now we meet via screen and, um, well, it's better than nothing. Yes. So thank you for being here. Thank you for oh. having me. Okay. Mm. Where are you? From where do you speak to us? I speak to you from North Bennington uh, in the wonderful state of Vermont, the first republic in the West world to have a ban against enslaving people. I didn't know Vermont, that. Vermont, the 14th state of the United States. Well, that's a good reason to move there. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. It also, and for some reason, has the least number of black people. I think they don't know that it's a wonderful place. Maybe you should, maybe you should kind of um, tell them so that I more try, people can I move try. there. Bernie Sanders is my senator. So you're talking from the house with the um, brown shingles and red shutters and yes. 30 windows? <laughs> yes, a lot of glass. I had to replace them recently and I uh, could have fed generations of my family for how much it costs. My family in Antigua, that is. Yeah, I just wanted to say you grew up in Antigua, but you've lived in the States for decades now. So is Vermont home? Does it feel like home? Oh, it very much does. Um, it's very mountainous. And um, I figured out that, uh, and, and it's landlocked. And I figured out that it was probably why I want to live here. So I could think about the thing I am from without seeing it. And I think when I see the thing I come from, I get swallowed up by it. So it sort of paralyzes me. I've never written so much as a sentence in Antigua. I always wait until I come home to Vermont to think about Antigua. But you did think about writing in Antigua. I, I thought about writing um, in a pretend way because I didn't know that people still uh, wrote literature. You know, I grew up in the 1950s um, uh, at the end, really at the end of the colonial era, though no one told us it was the end. For instance, we still celebrated Queen Victoria's birthday 
which was always very sad for me because my birthday came the day after. I'm the 25th of May. <laughs> so they celebrated the her instead of you. Yes, to this day, I don't like uh, a birthday party for m myself. I've never had a birthday party for myself, to this day. And the first, and the first thing at school was you saw a huge map and it said the British Empire. That's right. Oh my goodness. I've told you everything. <laughs> yes, the British Empire. Oh gosh, what a fairy tale. Well, <laughs> that would be another evening actually to talk about yes. it, what happened to the British Empire. Yes. Um, I'll, just, I'll just introduce you quickly here. Jamaica Kincaid, deswegen sind sie ja auch hier, weil sie das sowieso alle wissen, ist wirklich eine der angesehensten Schriftstellerin und aufregendsten Schriftstellerinnen der Vereinigten Staaten. Tief bewundert, mehrfach preisgekrönt. Und ähm, Susan Sonntag hat sie eine unwiderstehliche Autorin genannt. Ähm, heute unterrichtet Jamaica Kincaid in Harvard und wurde 1949 als Elaine Potter Richardson in Antigua geboren. Über den Namenswechsel werden wir natürlich noch reden. Und sie ging in eine britische Schule, war ausgezeichnet als Schülerin. Um, she said, I always was at the head of my class. And, um, aber dann entschied ihre Mutter, als sie ungefähr 16 war, sie aus der Schule rauszunehmen und als Nanny nach Amerika zu schicken. I'm just telling the story when your mother took you out of school, even though you were an excellent, excellent student, and sent you as a nanny to Scarsdale, I think, of all places, yes, in, in Connecticut. The, so no, it's in New York. It's just outside New York. Why did she do that? Why did she send you there? Because um, your brothers ate all the food and you had to go away? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, uh, they, my mother and my stepfather had three children um, who were 9, 11 and 13 years younger than me. And I think they didn't expect to have any children at all, maybe, or, but certainly not three. And my stepfather was sick at the same time. And um, it, they had a hard time supporting the family. And uh, there was an American base in, the, in Antigua. And um, these people were always um, looking for help for their children. And uh, somebody sent me to someone's house. My mother actually sent me to someone's house. And I was interviewed by someone I did not know and said, oh, yes, I will do. And I came to America with this family. At age 16. A little more than 16. And, you, and you were, that's what I read at least, you were so furious that you yes. um, refused to send any money home and you never forwarded an address when you left that house and you just cut ties for 20 years. That is true. Uh, that is true. I, um, I did at first, I did at first send my salary home, um, but then I grew very resentful. I stopped sending my salary home. I went to school at nights. So I earned a high school diploma. I started to go to college at nights, and then I just stopped uh, having any communication with my family at all. That is all true. Which is really shows a lot of strength, but you also kind of um, reconciled because look, this is what I felt in my, found in my, in my shelf. Oh, it my was published goodness. in 1983 at the bottom yes. of the river. I think it was your first or second book. It was my very first book. Your very a collection your first of so-called so short stories. Yeah. And here the dedication says, for my mother, Annie, with love. So mm -hmm. you forgave her. No. <laughs> Okay, so you, you just wrote people. that. You just wrote that out of politeness. No, you can love people, but you can you don't Not have like to them. forgive them. Yeah, That's true. well, well, it's true that uh, I sometimes liked her. I came to like her. I still don't think I love her, even though she's been dead many years. But um, I like. Um, I admire a lot of things about her and a lot of things in my life um, uh, I can trace directly to her, including um, my love of books, uh, my love of reading, my love of gardening, um, uh, the way I, I am a mother, 
um, when I when I was an the way you child, are a mother. Yes, you when inherited I was an old, some of that too. Well, there were some good things. Um, when uh, I was an only child, um, I was, you know, very uh, much adored. I mean, I was just telling someone that I, uh, I didn't like to eat, so my, I, unless my mother chewed my food and then <laughs> fed it to me, and she would, and I would uh, eat it. Um, she'd make me special things and. Uh, there were lots of um, uh, loving things that um, that you, things you would consider part of of love, but um, you know, very wonderful things. And I think I have um, borrowed some of that uh, in the way I regard my children. But I would never interfere. Um, I would never sacrifice them in the way I thought she sacrificed me. But it's wonderful uh, that you can see the positive side too and that you kind of, you know, did not resent her in general, obviously. I think that's very generous. Oh, I don't know. I resented her in general and then <laughs> the opposite of that. I think two, yeah, it's things, true. two things that are completely opposite are possible, um, you know, not being a Manichaean or whatever that word is at all, but I do think two things, love to and live, hate. Uh, to live yeah. contradictions. Yes, um, I love contradictions. I know. <laughs> <laughs> we are supposed to talk about the art of fiction, but let's talk about the art of writing first, because I've really read and heard you say one of the most amazing lines, and that is that you could write before you could read. Yes. What does that mean? Yes, that's an interesting... Uh, um, huh, it goes... Um, well... Uh, it's a, a sort of legend, uh, my mother would say to me. Uh, for instance, I was always told that I could talk before I could walk. And um, uh, people were very explicit about it, a sort of a, a wonder, a sense of, you know, she could talk before she, she could, could walk. walk. And uh, then um, my mother, of course, was a great reader, and I was an only child, and I would interrupt her reading. And so she taught me to read, but without an alphabet. She just taught me to read words. And... Um, so I I had this sense of um, the words, as I remember it, the words sort of leaping off the page and uh, entering me. I just knew how they worked, uh, how a word, and when I made a mistake and she corrected me, if I mispronounced, you know, uh, a word, and she said, no, it's this way, then I would know how it worked the next time I came across it, or something like it. And I think the book, the book I remember her reading, uh, teaching me to read from was um, a biography of Louis Pasteur. And- um, Oh, and she explained to you that it's because of him that she cooked the milk for you, right? Yes, yeah. yes, pasteurization. Um, so I always think of, of um, of, the, of my association with writing um, uh, in that way uh, that, oh, well, I mean, uh, for instance, you know, because I could uh, read uh, so well and uh, she sent me to school, but you could only go to school when you were five and I was three and a half. And uh, I remember her telling me, now remember if they ask you uh, how old you are to say you're five. And so I associate that with the beginning of um, me writing. Because uh, it's a fiction. I was have, I've had this fiction. I am five. Well, I'm not. And uh, when I went to school, I could read more than anyone else uh, in my age group 
though I had some difficulty because I suddenly encountered something called the alphabet and I had not been told there was an alphabet when I was taught to read. And I think the worst crisis or the first crisis I had with reading and writing was vowels. <laughs> and I thought, vowels? Uh, um, I'd never heard of them. Um, well, you managed. <laughs> Uh, and I just sort of, the teachers would just pass me around uh, and, um, you know, because I could just read and I could understand uh, uh, things, though I can give you an example of it that is, might be too long, but if you like, I can give you an example. Make it Should short. I you? <laughs> yes, I'll try please. To the book we were reading when I first went to school was a book about a farmer named Mr. Joe. He had a dog named Mr. Dan. He had a cat named Miss Tibbs. He had a, a hen, mother hen, she was called. She had 12 chicks. 11 of them were fluffy golden chicks. One was a larger chick and he was black feathered. And he was the one who was most troublesome and uh, always causing her to worry. Uh, one day he did something that she'd always told him not to do. Uh, he injured himself in doing it. And the sentence to describe his injury was, Percy, because that was his name, Percy the chick had a fall. And I think I, um, I never forgot the sentence. Obviously, <laughs> that's um, amazing. Well, I never forgot the sentence then. Of course, I, I, I'm speaking of, of it as, as it happened then. Um, so by the time I was seven, I was getting into all sorts of trouble because again, I was just overly, you know, interested in things. And she, uh, um, I did something in, in wrong and the punishment was to copy books one and two of John Milton's Paradise Lost. Um, uh, if you know uh, the story of the fallen angel who's uh, Lucifer and um, it had an illustration, that book, of the fallen Lucifer all in black and uh, standing defeated on a charred globe. And he had the most wonderful hair. It was all snakes and they were ready to strike. And for some reason, I connected it with Percy the Chick had a fall. <laughs> And uh, so that's so in that way so I, the art. I, so that's how the art of fiction started <laughs> at the age of three and a half and then seven. Yes, and, um, let's there, were thing, there were things in between, but those, I would say that the, the, those two incidents in, uh, that I tell you in reading was perhaps my first um, act of analyzing and connecting and, associating, um, and, think, yeah. and thinking beyond what was in front of me. And it was actually quite frightening. And I think it's the first time I've ever said this, that it, I, it frightened um, the people around me. That Because I, it was too much of, too, well, yes, too much of brightness. Well, yes, it was more than people expected. Yeah. Well, it more than and it continued that way. I mean, you just said before you were a nanny in Scarsdale, but you would go to school and you would go to kind of, you know, night classes and you would kind of, you know, um, make an amazing career. And here is the girl from Antigua, a nanny in Connecticut, and lo and behold, she becomes a staff writer of The New Yorker. I mean, the most <laughs> prestigious magazine around. How did that happen? Yeah. Oh, again, uh, uh, um, well, that part of my life, in, uh, how, becoming a writer and succeeding at it is sort of so much luck and ignorance. Um, you know, uh, what is it? Fools uh, are not of where angels fear to go. Fools where whatever. I was one of those fools who just went where no, no wise person uh, would go. I uh left college and um, i was going to a school in new hampshire and i left and uh 
went to New York and just announced I was a writer. Um, uh, and all the people I knew um, took me seriously or didn't discourage me. I started to write. And uh, one day, a man who wrote for the New Yorker, an ex a genius of a writer named George W.S. Trow, um, I was having dinner with him and he, I said something and he laughed very hard and he said, would you like to meet Mr. Sean? I had no idea who Mr. Sean was. And I said, oh, sure. So I met Mr. Sean. Uh, he said I should try to write something. I did. Who was the founder and editor-in-chief of the New Yorker? New Yorker. He was the second editor. The founder was um, Harold Ross, but he oh, was too. the second editor. Um, uh, so I wrote... Uh, something about the West Indian carnival in um, uh, Brooklyn. And uh, I wrote it in two parts, the notes I made when I was at the festival and then my reflections on what had happened. And I gave them to him and I thought he would ask someone to rewrite them, but instead he published them as I gave them to him. And I think it was at that moment I found out uh, just, or could see that what the thing, you know, you call the voice of a writer, I could see that that was, was it. And, uh, you know, for that, I owe him so much. Not many people would have understood um, that. And uh, so I started to write for The New Yorker. Then when I wrote my first uh, uh, piece of fiction, which was a short story that is one sentence long, but 600 words, and he published it. Again, not many people would have been able to see that that was the beginning of something. That's and why in the book that I have in front of me, um, the dedication is not only to, to your mother, for my mother Annie with love, but also for Mr. Sean with gratitude and love. Yes, and um, and um, and he obviously realized immediately when he saw Girl that here he did see something very special and published it in 1978. And we'd love for you to read it to us. Oh gosh! All right. You sure you wouldn't like me to read something else? <laughs> well, I know you've read it so often, but it's such a wonderful piece, and it's oh, the first right. one, and it meant oh, the breakthrough. Right. It really did. It. Yes, and I'll tell you, <clears throat> if I may quickly uh, tell you um, how I came to write it. Uh, uh, someone had given a, um, me a book of poems uh, as a present by uh, Elizabeth Bishop. Bishop, right. Yes, and the book was called Geography 3. And um, because of the person who gave it to me, I didn't like that person, so I hesitated to read the book because I have those kinds of ways. And then finally I opened it and I read it. And the first poem in it is called In the Waiting Room. And I read it and I'm not, this is not a fiction. I read it, I think once, and then I sat down and I wrote Girl. The way I felt at the time deeply felt at the time was as if someone had said, uh, had opened a door and said, come in. That was how I felt uh, when I read uh, In the Waiting Room and then sat down and wrote Girl. I always like to remember that because a writer, no matter how she looks, Elizabeth Bishop was a white woman um, but a writer uh, can do that for a, another writer, no matter how that other writer looks. So I just would like to say, Elizabeth. How it Bishop. came about. Yeah. Yes. All right. So, girl, wash the white clothes on Monday and put them on the stone heap. Wash the color clothes on Tuesday and put them on the clothesline to dry. Don't walk bareheaded in the hot sun. Cook pumpkin fritters in very hot sweet oil. Soak your little clothes right after you take them off. When buying cotton to make yourself a nice blouse, be sure that it doesn't have gum on it. 
because that way it won't hold up well after a wash. Soak salt fish overnight before you cook it. Is it true that you sing Benna in Sunday school? Always eat your food in such a way that it won't turn someone else's stomach. On Sundays, try to walk like a lady and not like the slut you are so bent on becoming. Don't sing Benna in Sunday school. You mustn't speak to wharf rat boys, not even to give directions. Don't eat fruits on the street, flies will follow you. But I don't sing Ben on Sundays at all and never in Sunday school. This is how to sew on a button. This is how to make a button hole for the button you have just sewed on. This is how to hem a dress when you see the hem coming down and sew to prevent yourself from looking like the slut I know you are so bent on becoming. This is how you iron your father's khaki shirt so that it doesn't have a crease. This is how you iron your father's khaki pants so that they don't have a crease. This is how you grow okra far from the house because okra tree harbors red ants. When you are growing dasheen, make sure it gets plenty of water or else it makes your throat itch when you are eating it. This is how you sweep a corner. This is how you sweep a whole house. This is how you sweep a yard. This is how you smile to someone you don't like too much. This is how you smile to someone you don't like at all. This is how you smile to someone you like completely. This is how you set a table for tea. This is how to set a table for dinner. This is how you set a table for dinner with an important guest. This is how you set a table for lunch. This is how you set a table for breakfast. This is how to behave in the presence of men who don't know you very well. And this way they won't recognize immediately the slut I have warned you against becoming. Be sure to wash every day, even if it is with your own spit. Don't squat down to play marbles. You are not a boy, you know. Don't pick people's flowers. You might catch something. Don't throw stones at blackbirds because it might not be a blackbird at all. This is how to make a bread pudding. This is how to make a dukna. This is how to make a pep to make pepper pot. This is how to make a good medicine for a cold. This is how to make a good medicine to throw away a child before it even becomes a child. This is how to catch a fish. This is how to throw back a fish you don't like. And that way, something bad won't fall on you. This is how to bully a man. This is how a man bullies you. This is how to love a man. And if this doesn't work, there are other ways. And if they don't work, don't feel too bad about giving up. This is how to spit up in the air if you feel like it. This is how to move quick so that it doesn't fall on you. This is how to make ends meet. Always squeeze bread to make sure it's fresh. But what if the baker won't let me feel the, fre feel the bread? You mean to say that after all, you're really going to be the kind of woman who the baker won't let near the bread? Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. I love that story. And um, after it had been published, you said, this is the way I want to write. And even if nobody likes it, this is That's the way I'm going to write. That's so you were stubborn and confident from the beginning. Yes, I, yes, confident. <clears throat> yes, I, I, I didn't even think of confidence. I, I think for the most part, I'm afraid of everything, but I do it anyway. Um, <laughs> that's a good, that's a good um, way of I, tackling your life. Well, I, I, of course, everything is terrible. It will, you know, but just do it. Um, uh, it yes, people sometimes say that I'm very courageous or something. I've never felt <clears throat> courageous. Um, I, I seem... But I think whenever was, you're honest, people say you're courageous. Yes, that might be so. Yes, so I hate to to think of myself as honest because there are so many people who are dishonest and they get along, they prosper very well. I'm longing to prosper here. Let me see how bad I can be. <laughs> 
prospered, haven't you prospered? But another question, um, how, much, how much of your writing has been really influenced also by growing up in Antigua? I mean, in this, in this piece, I mean, do you have the feeling that kind of, you know, maybe you were even quoting your mother in some ways? Um, yes. And you're growing uh, up in Antigua, so. Yes, yes. Um, uh, quoting my mother also, uh, the, uh, a story like that and also uh, the North, the novel Annie John, they are doing the thing you think they're doing. They, it's a, you know, they are instructions of a mother um, telling a, a girl how to be. But they, they also are about power and um, especially colonial oppressive uh, power. The mother is telling the girl, this is what you should do to, um, to exist, but it's in the mother's own way, quite the way a colonial situation has an example or a model of how should a person be themselves, how they should, what, what, is, a, what is proper for them exactly. to do. Exactly, yeah, that's the problem. Um, Yes, so um, uh, a lot of the things I have written about, um, uh, it seems to me that I've always been very interested in the uses and misuses of power. Obviously, it's, it's always good to have some power, at least over your own destiny. Um, but often um, you are not, you don't, and an external force is always determining um, how you should be, how you should, uh, how you should really experience yourself, how you should experience your experience. And Quite. not, and not because the rest of the world at this time, at the kind of you know the colonial world wanted you to behave. Interesting was, I mean, I I read that somewhere that you um, met racism really for the first time in the United States. Oh because yes, because you um, grew up in a black society and racism was not a, a topic. No, um, that's true. I grew up in a black society and racism was not a topic for us, it was a topic for Europeans yeah, visiting sure. us yeah. because, um, uh, you know, we were all black, so if something happened, you couldn't say, oh, the black person, because we would say, well, which one? <laughs> Who else? Um, but um, so I had not, uh, and, and you could see, you know, English people who's, who were white and, you know, I have to say we didn't have much respect for them because we didn't know why if they didn't like us, they were living among us. They seemed so irrational, really, and um, crazy. I would never live with people I didn't like and they didn't like black people. Why were they living with us? Anyway, uh, I, when I went to America, I discovered um, or, or racist things happened to me but i couldn't really take it seriously in in the way you you know um it hampers your development first of all so many of the white people i met in america were people that would never be considered white in antigua for instance in in a british understanding in of british white. whiteness mm -hmm. Yes, you know, I'd meet people from Lebanon. They were people who were, I think, displaced from the Middle East in the uh, 1940, after 1948. They've, a lot of people flooded into the uh, Caribbean and they, um, uh, but in America, they would consider themselves white and uh, people from, we never thought people from Spain were white or Italy or, oh my goodness. So when I came to America and <laughs> I met all these people who were white, I just, 
I just moved <laughs> on. Se seemed ridiculous. I it said, yeah, I said before that you were born Elaine Potter Richardson. Why did you change your name, and what happened to you when you oh, changed the name? Oh, a very good name? question. Um, I wanted to write. I didn't want my parents to know I was okay. writing because, for one thing, I was sure. I would fail at it. But as I say, you know, just because I would fail at it didn't mean I wouldn't try to do it. And um, so I was writing, uh, I thought I'd write under this um, other name. But actually, much later, I came to see that the person named Elaine Potter Richardson could not write about Elaine Potter Richardson. And so it was a uh, a wonderful angel that guided me into this uh, personality. And um, yeah, so the and change, you but you know, that, and, I, and I actually have later um, became obsessed with um, the power to name your things um, and uh, looking at um, the history of conquest. Uh, you know, one of the, the most important things um, the Spaniards did when they uh, ventured out into the world uh, and came in the West Indies was to rename all the islands they met. And that was the first, they had no armies. Columbus just walked around, sailed around, I should say, and looked at something and named it after uh, something that was familiar to him. So I. Um, so you uh, reconquered. Suppose, so um, you reconquered and called it Jamaica. Yes, I. <laughs> yes, and and the word uh, Jamaica actually apparently is an um, uh, Arawak or Taino name, but it's it's spelled slightly differently. Um, Cuba, Jamaica, and Haiti are perhaps the only three islands that re retain their um, native names. Uh, the others, Antigua is named after a church in Spain. Right. Saint Kitts is named after the myth of Saint Christopher and carrying the child Christ across a roaring river and so on. Dominica is because it's, he, he found it on a Sunday. Um, yes, but these, right, these right. Were, were names that laid uh, Spain, laid the claim for Spain. The naming of things is very uh, significant. Then I came to see that, uh, how important that was in the naming of plants through Carlos Linnaeus, um, the binomial system. So I, I, it turns out that so my have... changing my name had a deep, route that I wasn't even aware of when I did it. And it certainly helped writing about where you came from because you were so much freer to write. One of your books is called The Autobiography of My Mother. <laughs> and um, ich sag das kurz auf Deutsch, Kincaid erzählt darin die Geschichte von Xuela, I don't know if I pronounce it correctly, deren Mutter bei ihrer Geburt gestorben ist und die aufwächst mit einer sehr fiesen Stiefmutter und einem kriminellen Vater. Die Mutter kennt sie nicht, weiß kaum etwas für ihr. Und so ist eigentlich die Autobiografie der Mutter eher eine Autobiografie der mutterlosen Tochter. Und daraus hören wir jetzt mal etwas. Now she's reading a bit of, out of the, the German translation. Aus die Autobiografie meiner Mutter. Vor dem Ende der letzten Kurve kamen wir zu meiner Schule. Es war ein kleines Gebäude mit einer Tür und vier Fenstern. Es hatte einen Holzfußboden. Eine kleine Echse krabbelte über einen Balken in der Decke. Drei lange Pulte waren hintereinander aufgereiht. Ein großer, hölzerner Tisch und ein Stuhl standen vorne vor den drei langen Pulten. An der Wand hinter dem hölzernen Tisch und dem Stuhl hing eine Landkarte. Oben auf der Landkarte standen die Wörter »Das britische Weltreich«. Das waren die ersten Wörter, die ich lesen lernte. Immer waren in jenem Raum nur Jungen. Ich saß erst mit anderen Mädchen in einem Schulzimmer, als ich älter war. Ich hatte keine Angst vor dieser neuen Situation. Ich wusste damals nicht, wie das geht und weiß es heute nicht. Ich hatte keine Angst, weil meine Mutter schon gestorben war. Und das ist das Einzige, wovor ein Kind wirklich Angst hat. 
Als ich geboren wurde, war meine Mutter tot und ich hatte schon all die Jahre mit Eunice gelebt. Einer Frau, die nicht meine Mutter war und die mich nicht lieben konnte. Und ohne meinen Vater, von dem ich nie wusste, wann ich ihn wiedersehen würde. Und so hatte ich in dieser Situation keine Angst um mich. Und wenn es nicht wirklich stimmt, dass ich damals keine Angst hatte, so war es nicht das einzige Mal, dass ich mir meine Verletzlichkeit nicht eingestand. Wenn ich heute von jenen ersten Tagen klar und verständlich spreche, so erfinde ich nichts und es sollte nicht verwundern. Zu jener Zeit prägte ich mir alles, was geschah, mit einer Schärfe ein, die mir heute selbstverständlich vorkommt. Damals hatten diese Dinge noch keine Bedeutung. Sie hatten keinen Zusammenhang. Ich kannte die Geschichte von Ereignissen noch nicht. Ich kannte ihre Vorgeschichte nicht. Meine Lehrerin war von methodistischen Missionaren ausgebildet worden. Sie gehörte zum afrikanischen Volk, das konnte ich sehen. Und für sie bildete das eine Quelle der Demütigung und des Selbsthasses. Und sie trug die Verzweiflung wie ein Kleidungsstück, wie ein Umhang oder einen Stock, auf den sie sich ständig stützte, wie ein angeborenes Recht, das sie uns weiterreichen wollte. Sie liebte uns nicht, wir liebten sie nicht. Wir liebten einander nicht, nicht zu jener Zeit, zu keiner Zeit. Wir waren sieben Jungen und ich. Die Jungen gehörten auch alle zum afrikanischen Volk. Meine Lehrerin und diese Jungen schauten mich an und schauten mich an. Ich hatte dichte Augenbrauen. Mein Haar war buschig, dick und wellig. Meine Augen standen weit auseinander und sie hatten die Form von Mandeln. Meine Lippen waren auf unerwartete Weise breit und schmal. Ich gehörte zum afrikanischen Volk, aber nicht ausschließlich. Meine Mutter war eine karibische Frau und wenn sie mich ansahen, dann war es das, was sie sahen. Das karibische Volk war besiegt und dann ausgelöscht worden, beseitigt wie das Unkraut in einem Garten. Das afrikanische Volk war besiegt worden, hatte aber überlebt. Wenn sie mich ansahen, sahen sie nur das karibische Volk. Sie irrten sich, aber das sagte ich ihnen nicht. Ich begann damals sehr freimütig zu reden, mit mir selbst immer wieder, mit anderen nur, wenn es unbedingt nötig war. In der Schule sprachen wir Englisch, ordentliches Englisch, kein Patois. Und untereinander benutzten wir französisches Patois, eine Sprache, die als ganz und gar nicht anständig galt, eine Sprache, die Menschen aus Frankreich nicht sprechen und nur mit großer Mühe verstehen konnten. Ich redete mit mir, mit mir selber, weil ich anfing, den Klang meiner eigenen Stimme zu mögen. Sie hatte etwas Süßes für mich. Sie verringerte meine Einsamkeit, denn ich war einsam und sehnte mich nach Menschen, in deren Gesichtern ich etwas von mir selbst wiedererkennen konnte. Denn wer war ich? Meine Mutter war tot, meinen Vater hatte ich seit langer Zeit nicht mehr gesehen. Ich lernte sehr schnell lesen und schreiben. Mein Gedächtnis, meine Fähigkeit, mir Dinge zu merken, mich an die winzigste Einzelheit zu erinnern, zu behalten, wer was wann gesagt hatte, all das wurde für ungewöhnlich gehalten. So ungewöhnlich, dass meine Lehrerin, die nur in Form von Gut und Böse zu denken gelernt hatte und deren Urteil in derlei Dingen immer falsch war, sagte, ich sei böse, ich sei besessen. Und um zu bekräftigen, dass daran kein Zweifel bestehen konnte, verwies sie wieder auf die Tatsache, dass meine Mutter zum karibischen Volk gehörte. Meine Welt damals, still, sanft und pflanzenhaft in ihrer Empfindlichkeit, den machtvollen Launen anderer unterworfen und von Tageslauf bestimmt, der jeden Morgen mit der fahlen Eröffnung von Licht anfing und mit dem plötzlichen Einbruch der Dunkelheit zu Beginn jeder Nacht endete. Diese Welt war ein Geheimnis für mich und gleichzeitig eine Quelle manchen Vergnügens. Ich liebte das Gesicht eines grauen Himmels, durchlässig, körnig, feucht, der mich an unzähligen Morgen zur Schule begleitete und sanfte Wasserpfeile auf mich niedersandte. Das Gesicht desselben Himmels, wenn er ein hartes, schutzverweigerndes Blau zeigte, als Hintergrund für eine grausame Sonne. Die strenge Hitze, die schließlich ein Teil von mir wurde, so wie mein Blut. Die schwer beladenen Bäume, manche Äste hatten den Umfang kleiner Baumstämme, die so ungehindert wuchsen, als bestünde Schönheit nur in Größe. Und ich konnte sie alle auseinanderhalten, wenn ich die Augen schloss und auf das Geräusch der Blätter horchte, die raschelnd aneinander rieben und liebte jeden Augenblick, wenn die weißen Blüten der Zeder zu Boden fielen, mit einer Lautlosigkeit, die ich hören konnte. Anfangs waren die Blütenblätter noch frisch, ein sanfter Kuss aus rosa und weiß. Einen Tag später dann waren sie zertreten, 
verwelkt und braun, eine Plage für das Auge. Ich liebte den Fluss, der zu einer kleinen Lagune geworden war, als er eines Tages einfach seine Richtung änderte und an dessen Ufer ich gerne saß, Vogelfamilien zusah und Fröschen, die ihren Laich abwägten. Dem Himmel, der von schwarz zu blau wechselte und von blau zu schwarz und dem Regen, der ins Meer hinter der Lagune fiel, aber nicht auf dem Berg, der hinter dem Meer war. An diesem Platz war es, wo ich zum ersten Mal von meiner Mutter träumte. Ich war auf den Steinen eingeschlafen, die rings um mich den Boden bedeckten. Und mein kleiner Körper war in sie hineingesunken, als seien es Federn. Ich sah meine Mutter eine Leiter herunterkommen. Sie trug ein langes, weißes Gewand, dessen Saum ihr genau bis an die Fersen reichte. Und das war alles, was von ihr zu sehen war, nur ihre Fersen. Sie stieg und stieg herunter, doch mehr wurde von ihr nicht enthüllt. Nur ihre Fersen und der Saum ihres Gewandes. Zuerst wollte ich unbedingt mehr sehen. Dann reichte es mir, dass ich einfach nur ihre Fersen sah, die zu mir herunterstiegen. Als ich erwachte, war ich nicht mehr das Kind, das ich gewesen war, bevor ich einschlief. Ich sehnte mich danach, meinen Vater zu sehen und wollte für immer in seiner Nähe sein. An dem Tag, dessen Anfang ich nicht als irgendwie auffällig in Erinnerung habe, lernte ich die Grundbegriffe für das Schreiben eines gewöhnlichen Briefs. Ein Brief hat sechs Teile. Die Adresse des Absenders, das Datum, die Adresse des Empfängers, die Anrede oder Grußformel, den Brief selber, das Ende des Briefs. Es war vollkommen klar, dass ein Mensch mit der Aussicht auf ein Leben, wie es mich erwartete, das Leben einer Frau, die noch dazu arm ist, niemals in die Verlegenheit kommen würde, einen Brief zu schreiben. Doch das Gefühl von Befriedigung, das alle empfanden, die daran beteiligt waren, mir diese Sache beizubringen, nämlich einen Brief zu schreiben, muss ungeheuer gewesen sein. Ich wurde geschlagen und mit schlimmen Wörtern beschimpft, als ich einen Fehler machte. Damals machte es mich nicht wütend, dass ich Briefe von Leuten abschreiben musste, deren Klagen oder Ansichten oder Freuden mich gar nicht interessierten. Ich war zu jung, um zu begreifen, dass Eitelkeit eine Waffe sein kann, ebenso gefährlich wie jedes Messer. Ich wollte einfach nur meine eigenen Briefe schreiben. Briefe, in denen ich sagen würde, was ich über mein Leben dachte, so wie es mir mit sieben Jahren erschien. Ich fing einen Brief an meinen Vater an. Ich schrieb, mein lieber Papa, in prächtiger, kunstvoller Schönschrift, einer Schönschrift, geboren aus Schlägen und groben Wörtern. Ich sagte ihm, dass ich von Neunis in Wort und Tat misshandelt wurde und dass er mir fehlte und dass ich ihn sehr liebte. Ich schrieb dies immer und immer wieder. Es war ohne Einzelheiten. Es war einfach nur der klagende Schrei eines kleinen, verwundeten Tiers. Mein lieber Papa, Du bist der einzige Mensch, den ich noch habe auf der Welt. Niemand liebt mich, nur du kannst das. Ich werde mit Wörtern geschlagen, ich werde mit Stöcken geschlagen, ich werde mit Steinen geschlagen, ich liebe dich über alles, nur du kannst mich retten. Diese Worte waren ganz und gar nicht für meinen Vater gedacht, sondern für die Person, von der ich nur die Fersen sehen konnte. Nacht um Nacht sah ich ihre Fersen, nur ihre Fersen, die herunterkamen, um bei mir zu sein. Die herunterkamen, um für immer bei mir zu sein. Dankeschön. That is wonderful. Even though I don't understand the word of it. In your book about your brother, a book that had been nominated for the National Book Award, um, you wrote you became a writer out mm. of desperation. Yes, that's true. I, it certainly feels uh, that way. It, it wasn't, um, you know, I, I see my students, uh, sometimes they are going to MFA programs and they are doing all uh, sorts of things. I don't know why they're writers, um, but I don't discourage them. I, uh, everyone can't have a, the a reason to be a writer, but uh, uh, yes, there wasn't anything else I really could do. Um, there was anything else I was trained to do, but write. I had I had to write. I I would have written um, even if I had could only support myself scrubbing floors. I would have written. I think would have. Yeah, it's, uh, 
it's a way it was it was and perhaps still is um, a way of of saving myself and i don't mean myself as i'm sitting before you here but some some self some way of understanding uh, or try the attempt i shouldn't say understanding because i don't understand anything but attempting to understand attempting to see what is it what what is this um i th i think yes it uh yeah and in in the uh i'm sorry i couldn't save my brother too and maybe i couldn't ever but i didn't know enough to try the way I should have tried. But yes, I, it saved my life. But you even said when your brother died of AIDS that um, if you didn't write about it, you had the feeling you might have to die with him. So the writing really saved you, maybe not to understand, but to continue living. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, yes, I, hmm, yes, sometimes I do have an insight into, I can find an insight into something, yes, uh, well, his, oof, that's always hard to talk about, I'm always happy to talk about writing, and I'm going along nicely talking about my mother, and then, ah, my brother, because it was his uh, arrival in the world that um, changed the course of my life. It's possible that if he had not been born, I would have continued, um, you know, uh, the way people thought I would have, I would have won scholarships to this, that, or the other. Um, but his arrival uh, pushed us into a, an economic strain that we had never experienced. And uh, it led to um, my going away. The funny thing about him is that he and I had a lot in common. Um, Can we get back uh, to the writing? Reading, yes, he might have been a writer, but I mean, by, oh, of course, by the time he was uh, growing up, he he um, fell in love with more popular culture. He would wanted to be a reggae singer or something like that. It never occurred to me to be anything in, in popular. But um, also, you know, he was a, a man and um, um, he could get away with things that I, I wouldn't have been able to. But anyway, his, his um, death... Um, yeah, it's one of those but, really sad, yeah. Yeah, I just want to get back to writing and um, hear you start talking about your brother because he was really kind of, you know, a motivation for one of your books, which is called My yes. Brother. Yes. And so you wrote, wrote about, because it was kind of, you know, you hadn't been there for quite a while and then you came back when he was sick and you kind of bought him lots of medicines even though you didn't like him and you had to buy them on credit and you did really a lot of things for him. And then you wrote this book in order to, in a way, save yourself. So what does it mean if one tries to transform one's personal life into literature? Hmm. What does it mean? Oh, I, <laughs> um, I, in my own, I can only speak uh, for myself. I am, uh, I, I am not uh, a writer of domestic tales. Um, yeah, you always said uh, conventional, conventional writing is not for me, you said. No, no, a writing of, uh, oh God, I don't even know because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but um, uh, I always feel uh, from the time I thought I would write that um, it had, I was going to write about something. You know, I should um, perhaps quickly tell you that it, the, the influences that, um, that 
pervades my writing. Um, the King James Version of the Bible, um, the King, uh, Concise Oxford Dictionary, and um, Paradise Lost by uh, John Milton. But, um, uh, but particularly the King James Version which, of the Bible, which was the only thing I had to read um, consistently, that never, I always had that, and I would read it back and forth and uh, um, would have opinions about it. And it's a, if you look, you can see how, what a big influence it is. For instance, you know, so many of my sentences begin with a conjunction, which you are forbidden to do. Um, but a sense of um, purpose, um, uh, very much pervades my writing and I, um, you know, I'm not an artist making land art in the Nevada desert because uh, the desert isn't pretty enough or ugly enough or something. I'm not that kind of person. Um, it's, it's not... I write... Go I'm on. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. As I say, I write because I feel I must. Uh, so probably I'm very much influenced by prophetic writing, um, writing that must be done. And uh, 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 my great, oh, I don't know, hero or example, I always tell this to my students who are always looking for careers in writing, is um, an example of the Apostle Paul, whom I don't like at all. I don't agree with him on anything. Um, but he was always writing these letters to the Corinthians, the Galatians, the various Shins, and I'm not sure any of them read his letters. But the point is that there are no Galatians today, there are no Corinthians today. But Paul's letters exist, and so that is my aspiration: is to write something that, that will still exist. Yes, that I don't really matter, but the writing will matter. So I'm very influenced by, yes, prof prophetic. <laughs> Yes. And you have also, I mean, it was kind of, you know, writing out of desperation and also writing out of anger. I mean, your, your really? books are have very you autobiographical and they are extremely <laughs> political. Have they you are... read Paul's letters? Everything you say, you could, uh, political, uh, what was the other? Paul's it's letters. Autobiographical. autobiographical. And you said, you said at one point, I now consider anger as a badge of honor. Yep. Paul's letters. There you go. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I and never thought I was fulfilling Paul. A person I do not like at all. I have these I had these quarrels with him as a child, and now here I am. So here we are, finding out. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Another quote, because yes. I love that. Instead of kind of talking about your anger, people should say, I'm a good author because that's what I am. I'm a great author. So here oh. comes back the question of confidence. I can't believe I said that. I must okay. have been. That's one of I those quotes where you never know if it's true or not. <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> I, I'm sure I said it, but I must have been feeling um, uh, quite... Um, defensive about I, I think I even remember and I said that the last book I published um, a book called see now then which made everyone um, was it, it, it's very uh, it's, a, it's I admit it's a difficult it's uh, a brilliant book but I gasped reading it <laughs> <laughs> I must admit <laughs> But, um, let's, but let's advance right. because we are right. a bit running out of time. So and right. I definitely want to talk about you as a garden woman because that's what you've been yes. and that's what you've become. And you've written a wonderful book, kind of, you know, my garden book. And um, it's um, talking about the, your love of the plants and your love of yes. kind of, you know, growing and making a beautiful garden. And you sound quite quite passionate about it. And there are scenes in it that I absolutely love, and that is Jamaica Kincaid 
in a hot bath and kind of, you know, really s <laughs> <laughs> and really kind of going through the catalogs on potatoes oh, and the yeah. catalogs on whatever. And oh, um, so the garden really plays a big role in your life now. Yes. Um, yes. How, would you call yourself a garden woman? Oh, gosh. Well, no. Because but it's become well, important. Yes. Uh, it's an extension of writing. You no, know, that's I, what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. I walk around and write in it. And yeah, it's a big part of... Uh, I don't know where the writing begins and the uh, garden, you know. But again, going... Um, back to the King James Version uh, of, of the, uh, the Bible. Yes, I'm, I don't like bringing up the Bible because it's taken up by the, some of the worst people in the world. Um, but it's really an interesting book. Uh, highly rec recommend it for all sorts of things to dwell on. But um, again, the garden, uh, when you talk about the garden, the creation story uh, in the garden is a big influence on my uh, understanding of the garden, you know, and uh, it's because it's place in um, the way power is distributed, you, you know, you can find, uh, find it in that little story, you know, God giving Adam um, the uh, sharing with Adam the garden, telling him to name things as if God doesn't know the names of anything, but it was a <laughs> way of sharing um, the garden and the poor stupid Adam, you know, just, oh, this is this, this is, but God but isn't, it, planting, we never know. Planting the garden and writing, and we'll have a little piece of that reading being read by Patricia in German now. Aus Very well. Mein Gartenbuch. In blinder, gefühlsmäßiger und hilfloser Liebe für Annie und für Harold, die manchmal der zornigen Überzeugung sind, dass nur der Garten zwischen ihnen und einem vollkommenen Einssein mit ihrer Mutter steht und manchmal recht damit haben. Okay, is that that's the, that's the dedication? My children have never forgiven me for that. I thought it was the funniest dedication ever. They still. Uh, And they were, they were children. They, I taught them to make me a martini and they would bring it to me in the garden and they stopped after that. <laughs> after that <laughs> dedication. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah that, that was it. And to this day, they, uh, but I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> um, anyway, yes, the garden is... Um, She'll yeah, read but, from but, the book but, now. Oh, She very will, well. Okay. Thank you. Dass ich als Erwachsener eine Neigung zum Garten fasste, kam so. Kurz nachdem ich zum ersten Mal Mutter geworden war, schenkte mir mein Mann zum sogenannten Muttertag eine Hacke, einen Rechen, einen Spaten, eine Grabgabel und Blumensamen. Es war mein zweiter Muttertag. Zum ersten hatte er mir Ohrringe geschenkt. Die hatte ich in der Küche auf einen Tisch gelegt, von wo sie auf Nimmerwiedersehen verschwanden. Weder ich noch sonst jemand, nicht die Putzfrau, nicht die Frauen, die mir halfen, mein Kind zu hüten, nicht mein Mann, nicht mein Kind. Niemand hat sie angeblich je wieder gesehen. Ich kann mich nicht erinnern, ob die Samen und die Werkzeuge eingepackt waren. Aber ich kann mich erinnern, dass ich sofort damit nach draußen ging und einen großen Teil des kleinen Gartens umgrub, einen Flecken Erde, der noch nie bestellt worden war. Und dass ich alle Samen aus den Tütchen in die Erde brachte. Und dabei blieb es, denn nichts ging auf. Der Boden war nicht ordentlich vorbereitet. Er lag im Schatten einer mächtigen Eiche und eines mächtigen Ahorns. Ja, diese beiden Bäume standen tatsächlich in unmittelbarer Nachbarschaft und ich wusste nicht, was ich an ihnen hatte. Zu ärgerlich, dass sie im Herbst ihre Blätter verloren und den ganzen Garten verschmutzten, dachte ich damals. Nebenan wohnte ein Mann namens Chet, der nur richtig atmen konnte, wenn er an eine Sauerstoffflasche angeschlossen war. Hin und wieder kam er heraus, rauchte eine Zigarette und kümmerte sich um seine riesigen Tomaten, die dicht am Haus wuchsen. Die Tomaten waren dort der vollen Sonne ausgesetzt und ihm war einerlei, ob aus dem Baumaterial seines Hauses womöglich Gift in den Boden gelangt waren, in dem seine Tomaten wuchsen. 
Seine Toba Tomaten gediehen und schmeckten köstlich. Mein Gartenstück, das ich um den Preis von Blasen und schmutzigen Händen umgegraben hatte, sah aus, als hätte ein Tier dort irgendetwas Interessantes vermutet und vergeblich danach gewühlt. Kein Mensch hätte beim Anblick dieses Durcheinanders, das ich angerichtet hatte, auf den Fundort eines verloren geglaubten Schatzes getippt. Ich zog in ein anderes Haus, das gar nicht weit weg war und einen größeren Garten hatte. Chad starb und ich, schämte mich noch, und ich schäme mich noch heute, dass ich ihn nach meinem Umzug nie mehr besuchte. Ich war auch nicht auf seiner Beerdigung, obwohl ich davon wusste. Und wenn ich heute seiner Frau Millie begegne, geht sie mir aus dem Weg. Und ich mache es gewiss genauso, aber ich denke doch, dass er sie es ist, die mir aus dem Weg geht. Das Haus, in das ich zog, hatte einer Mrs. McGovern gehört. Und auch sie war gerade gestorben, aber ich hatte sie nicht gekannt und vorher auch noch nie von ihr gehört. Deshalb brachte ich das Haus vom Gefühl her nicht mit ihr in Verbindung. Bis eines Tages, in meinem ersten Frühjahr, in diesem neuen Haus und auf dem neuen Grundstück, Folgendes geschah. Im Herbst hatten wir jemanden teuer dafür bezahlt, dass er den Rasen hinter dem Haus neu anlegte. Der Rasen war auch sehr schön geworden. Doch im Frühjahr schoben sich an vielen Stellen rötlich-braune Triebe durch die schöne neue grüne Fläche. Ich ärgerte mich so sehr, dass ich gerade kurz davor stand, den Rasenmenschen anzurufen und mich bitter zu beklagen, als meine neue Nachbarin, Beth Winter, mich besuchen kam und mir erzählte, wie schön es für sie sei, mit ihrer Familie, ihrem Mann und drei Kindern, in demselben Haus zu wohnen, in dem sie aufgewachsen war. Als sie meine Klagen über den Rasenmenschen hörte und die rötlich-braunen Triebe sah, sagte sie, aber Mrs. McGovern hatte doch ein Peonienbeet. Und so lernte ich, wie junge Peonientriebe aussahen und auch wie Ahorn aussieht, aber nicht, dass er auf Lateinisch Azer heißt. Die lateinischen Namen lernte ich erst später mit Widerstand. In jenem ersten Frühjahr im Haus der alten Mrs. McGovern, da war sie schon lange tot, entdeckte ich ihr großes altes Taillenbeet, Hemero Callis Fulva, das direkt unter dem südwestlichen Küchenfenster wuchs. Und Rob, Wilmington, kam mit seinem bescheidenen Rototiller und fräste ein schönes, großes Rechteck für meinen Gemüsegarten und lief dann mit diesem bescheidenen Rototiller hinter mir her, einmal um das Haus herum und legte auf mein Geheiß wunderlich geformte Beete an, sodass es schließlich aussah, als sei um das Haus ein schützender Wassergraben gezogen. Aber es war kein richtiger Graben mit Wasser darin, sondern das Ergebnis einer ersten begeisterten Annäherung an die Gartenkunst. So fing mein Garten an. Es wäre aber auch nicht falsch zu erwähnen, dass ich damals gerade ein Buch las von dem Historiker William Prescott und dass es in diesem Buch um die Eroberung Mexikos oder, wie man damals sagte, Neuspaniens ging. Und ich darin auf Blumen stieß, die Tagetes hießen und da Ta Dalie und Zinnie. Danach war der Garten für mich mehr als der Garten, den ich vorher im Kopf gehabt hatte. Danach war auch der Garten selbst etwas anderes. Als ich mich endgültig in Mrs. McGoverns Haus eingelebt hatte oder dem gelben Haus, wie die Kinder es nannten, denn es war gelb angestrichen, hatte ich schon Teile des Rasens hinter dem Haus und Teile des Rasens vor dem Haus zu sehr wunderlichen, gartenunüblichen Formen umgegraben oder umgraben lassen. Diese Beete, denn ich versuchte, so etwas wie Blumenbeete zustande zu bringen, waren von eigentümlicher Gestalt, eigentümlich im Vergleich zu Blumenbeeten, wie sie im Garten üblich sind. Mir war klar, dass sie eigentümlich waren und dass sie nicht so aussahen wie die Blumenbeete in von mir bewunderten Gärten, den Gärten meiner Freunde, in Gartenbüchern beschriebenen Gärten. Aber das war nun nicht zu ändern. Ich wünschte mir einen Garten, der so aussah wie etwas, was ich im Geiste zu sehen meinte. Aber was genau das war, das wusste ich damals nicht und weiß es bis heute nicht. Und ich glaube auch zu wissen, warum das so war. Der Garten ist für mich so eng mit Worten über den Garten und mit Worten an sich verknüpft, dass jede feste Vorstellung von Garten, jedes feste Bild für mich eine Provokation darstellt. Erst als ich ein paar Jahre später in das Haus von Dr. Woodworth lebte, dem braun verschindelten Haus mit den roten Fensterläden, durchschaute ich die Form dieser Beete. Dort hatte ich viel mehr Platz. Ich hatte einen Rasen und hinter dem Rasen noch mehrere Morgen Land. Der Rasen hinter diesem Haus war größer als der Rasen hinter dem Haus der alten Mrs. McGovern. Und deshalb waren auch meine Beete größer und wunderlicher, den in einem richtigen Garten üblichen Beeten noch unähnlicher. 
Und es wurde immer schwieriger, sie anderen Gärtnern zu erklären, die mehr Erfahrung mit dem Garten und einem herkömmlicheren Schönheitsbegriff von Gärten hatten als ich. Was war denn das? Was ist denn das? wurde ich gefragt. Was denkst du dir dabei? wurde ich gefragt. Manchmal antwortete ich dann, ich weiß es selbst nicht. Und manchmal auch mit tiefem Schweigen. Als mir dämmerte, dass der Garten, den ich schuf und immer noch schaffe und in Zukunft schaffen werde, so ähnlich aussah wie eine Landkarte der karibischen Inseln und des Meeres drumherum, erzählte ich es nicht den Gärtnern, die mich gefragt hatten, was das sei oder was ich mir dabei gedacht hatte. Ich konnte nur staunen, wie sehr doch der Garten für mich eine Übung des Erinnerns ist, eine Möglichkeit zu einer Vergangenheit zu finden, die meine eigene ist, die Karibik, und einer Vergangenheit, die indirekt zu mir in Beziehung steht, die Eroberung Mexikos und der umliegenden Gebiete. Dankeschön. Danke. So, for Jamaica, Kincaid, even gardens are, in a way, a political statement, and they are kind of, you know, a way of recalling Antigua and growing up in Antigua. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about this any further, but... Um, that is unfortunate, because people like to think of gardens as a place of relaxing, and I'm su I suppose it is but it also is a place of extreme disturbance. And, uh, but I find extreme disturbance relaxing. So there you are. Well, I just wanted to say, kind of, you know, if a garden was just calmness for you, you would kind of, you know, grow something that would disturb you, right? <laughs> yes, that's <laughs> Because right. that's what you need, if I understand <laughs> it correctly. Yes, yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> Life is a disturbance. That's a wonderful last sentence for all of us. Thank you very much, Jamaica, Ken Jamaica Kincaid, for kind of joining us tonight. And next Thank time, you'll have to come in person because I we really all will. want to meet you oh, I and will. hear I more about, about um, kind of, you know, your garden and your writing. And plus, we are hoping, of course, for another novel. Are you writing? Yes, I am. Ah, I never stop good. writing. Um, are you talking about what are you going to write? Or will oh, you not no. talk about it? No. No, I understand that. Because then it's dissipating once one starts talking about it. Okay, it thank you. Thank you very much. It was delightful you. having you here. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Danke.